Hey, welcome back to Dan Life Chess. This is Joel. It is time for round three of the uh, Sacramento uh, tournament I played last week, last weekend. Um, if you haven't watched the first two recaps, go back and watch them. But uh, I ended up winning the first two games, spoiler alert. And I was paired against um, a player that was rated about 1,000. Now, this opponent was probably, I don't know, maybe 12 years old. Um, I watched in the first round him hold a difficult position against the 1600 to a draw. And then in round two, just wipe his opponent off the board, um, who was also like a, a little over a thousand, uh, even I think a little bit higher rated than he was. Uh, so I was kind of nervous going into this game. Obviously, to win the tournament, I would only need a draw. Um, but to salvage any kind of rating gain, um, I cannot lose to this thousand rated player. But as you know, if you play in tournament chess a lot, uh, these thousand rated uh, young young uh, players can, they're kind of a wild card. Uh, they could be playing at uh, uh, 2000 strength or 500 strength, um, really anywhere in between. So. I kind of looked online, didn't have a lot of time. I didn't see any like chess.com profiles or uh, Lee Chess profiles. So I just kind of was thinking, I remember, I believe him playing the white side um, and, and getting the um, Rui Lopez. So I kind of was assuming we would get E4. And uh, it kind of reminded me actually this tournament I play most of my games online and all of my, you know, online accounts are pretty much open and anybody that wants to know what I play, they could easily find it. Not only that, I have a YouTube channel talking about my opening repertoire. So I don't know if preparation matters that much at my level, but perhaps maybe it's something I should think about, but who cares, right? I'm just an amateur chess player enjoying the game. So uh, let's go ahead and get to the game. My opponent, Benjamin Liu, rated about a thousand. And uh, here we have the game. Uh, he started the game E4. Like I said, I was expecting that. And I believe I've been playing the Karakon a lot. Uh, if you know, if you followed this channel a lot, I kind of had a, a few years where I was playing only the Scandinavian. And I like the Scandinavian a lot. I think, um, matter of fact, if I were to recommend to a um, kind of a beginner chess player, I, I really think the Queen D8 Scandinavian is great. You know, you get your pieces out. Um, I'm sorry, you you oftentimes will just get this this formation and you castle. You know, you get a strong position. Well, I've been um, kind of going back and forth with my opening repertoire during the hiatus of um, recording videos. I actually dabbled in playing the French defense uh, with E6 and, and I liked it a lot. I, I really did. I just, some of the positions I just, I don't know, the cramped nature, the locked in light squared bishop, it wasn't for me. Um, so my my debut of playing the Karakon over the board happened in this tournament on the board. And uh, so Karakon, uh, here we go. C6, uh, my opponent plays the most principled reply, uh, D4, establishing a very strong pawn center. I strike with D5 trying to disrupt uh, this uh, pawn center. And my opponent, although only rated 1,000, chooses the most aggressive line against the Karakon, uh, arguably, and that is the advanced variation. Now, I'll be honest with you. Looking at this board, I thought to myself, okay, either this game is going to go one of two directions. And I find this to be true with a lot of junior chess players. Um, you will basically play the opening and you'll either get someone who knows theory 15, 20 moves deep, or they just kind of play principal chess and they're really good at tactics. And maybe they have pet lines that they're better at. Now I mentioned in round two, after he had drawn to the 1600 player, he's coming into this round one and a half. I watched him play the white side of the Roy Lopez and Honestly, if there was ever a thing, I, I thought I would never play E5 with against this kid because uh, uh, he knew his stuff. And I, I mean, he just he, he played very well. Uh, his, he did not uh, 
uh, his opponent didn't really have much of a chance and he kind of wiped him off the board. Um, so the move that's kind of trendy right now and it's really popular in um, amateur level is this move C5. Now, the most grandmaster type of move is bishop f5. Uh, it leads to some complicated positions. You get your bishop out of the pawn chain. And, um, and perhaps maybe when I grow up and get uh, a little bit stronger uh, and uh, wiser, maybe I'll play that. But for right now, I really am liking the positions that I see with c5. Now, my opponent played a very common but already inaccurate move c3 and it was at this point that i really i thought to myself okay i don't know if my opponent knows these c5 um Kirokon structures very well so i was starting to get a little bit um you know i was getting confident that this might be this might this game might turn out to in my favor so i played uh knight c6 which is the correct way and then my opponent played knight f3 at this point, I'm I'm very happy. This is exactly what every Karakon player wants. I take, um, he takes, and then I play bishop g4. Now, if you look at this structure, um, he played bishop e2, and I played e6. Essentially, black has a supercharged French defense. Um, it's like a French advance, but the, the c pawns are gone, okay? And this bishop has magically teleported across uh, the uh, e6 pawn to g4. And if you could teleport your light squared bishop in the French defense to a good square, everybody would play the French fence, or maybe not, but a lot of people would. A lot more people would play the French fence. So this is the kind of structure I like. I'm going to be getting a lot of pressure on d4. I have ideas like this. I can move in my knight here. I'm fine. Uh, we have we have a game to play, but I feel like this is going to be um, this is going to be a game that's going to have some strategic a strategic battle, okay, around the d4 pawn. And I noticed this as well when you're playing against juniors. They don't always like to be in that defensive. They like the attack, and I could tell my opponent actually knew how to attack well, but my opponent plays a move um, that is not the greatest. Uh, plays b3. Oops. And as soon as I saw this move, I thought to myself a few things. First of all, the move that just screams at me is bishop b4. And come to find out, bishop b4 is correct in a very concrete way. But I don't want to spoil the, the idea because we get a very similar line in the position that I ended up playing. But my opponent played b3, and he's kind of blitzing out these moves to this point. And I took some time and I thought to myself, okay, I have 75 minutes. So I kind of hunkered down and thought through the psychology of the position. My opponent, I don't think, wanted to play bishop e3 and protect his pawn on e3, although that is the correct maneuver in this position, because I get things like this. His idea behind b3 is simply to play bishop to b2 and to guard the pawn. Albeit it doesn't work, that was his idea. So when I thought of bishop b4 check, I didn't want him to have to guard with his bishop. I wanted his bishop on this diagonal because I feel like my bishop will be much more powerful if it is. So I end up playing queen b6. Now, this is still a favorable move. Black is still doing better according to Stockfish, but it's not as accurate. And as I suspected, my opponent played bishop to b2. And here it becomes very concrete. I looked and I calculated and I, I was very convinced that I was going to be able to put a lot of pressure or possibly win uh, the d4 pawn simply by a sequence of forcing moves. Bishop to b4 check. The correct move in this position is not a move that most players would play, and that is king to f1. Now, if you're playing white and you're playing against someone who plays the Karakon, 
And on move 10, you have to make a move like king to f1. That is not the uh, opening that you signed up for. Um, so most players, most human players, are going to, after they see this check, they're going to try to block it. Now, he could block it here, but simply I would take, I could even play, I could just even play a, a move like knight, G, knight g7, um, but this is not going to be good. Now, my opponent plays knight c3, which is actually worse uh, because he loses coordination guarding the d4 square. I spent a little bit of time. I wanted to make sure that there was no weird checks. I've fallen into falling for this pawn, but since this pawn is on b3, there's no checks out here. It's just a safe position. I take and my opponent takes. Then I take with the queen. I'm threatening here, okay? I'm also threatening here. So my opponent really has to take the queen. I take, and my opponent castles. Now, at this point, it's not really wise to castle. Perhaps uh, king d1, the computer suggesting king f1, something, but they castle. I said, I'm going to take this, disrupt the this pawn chain. I'm basically going to disrupt his pawn structure. And right here, I thought for some time. If you look at the position, I have a very healthy pawn structure. I am up a pawn, and this pawn happens to be a pass pawn. Now, I know that at Grandmaster level, they're not going to play the move that I played. I don't know if they would. I, I find it to be very practical. And if you know the title of this video and the thumbnail, Old Man Chess Rules. Sometimes, sometimes it is incredibly uh, rewarding and uh, it's very uh, fulfilling and satisfying to play Old Man Chess, especially when you're playing against a youngster who in more than in, in less than a year will be higher rated than me and in less than two years i will never be able to beat again so in this position i chose old man chess for the win i did not want him to have a tricky knight this bishop i can always take it i can work around that bishop that bishop stuck on the dark squares i take here he's forced to take back obviously and then I played knight e7. Because this bishop is on the c-file, and there's no immediate tempo into the c-file with the rooks, I calculated all this. I thought, I have a little bit of time, and I'm just going to play old man chess. And this game, from this point on, is like a, is like, it, it is a hat tip to old man chess and all those boring chess players out there that love to just grind out um, a, a solid advantage. My opponent played bishop to b4. And right here, I had a decision. I could play here. I could play here. Um, or I could just leave the knight there and let it be taken. But instead, old man chess, I played knight f5. And although the computer says every one of those moves is e you know equally as strong, I give this a... Uh, exclamation point. Why is that? This knight is a it, 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 an outposted on f5 on a light square. This bishop can do nothing about it. And yeah, like sometimes they want to get their bishop here and move here and get, you know, get in here somehow, even though I have time and, you know, no, not going to allow it. Not going to allow it. You play here. I'm just chopping that off takes and I'm coming in here. I'm going to get that pawn. So that's never going to happen. So I played knight f5. I'm eyeing the d6 square. So my opponent then uh, plays rook a c1, uh, trying to get in on the c file. Obvious move here. Nope. If you'll notice, my king just stays on the light squares, unless I have to. Um, then uh, he plays rook uh, c3, trying to double up. Even if he actually doubles up, I have enough protection here. I just played rook here. Uh, he uh, tries to double up. I simply take, take, I move here, 
and he moves here. I was kind of surprised when he moved there. I was like, oh, never mind. Your bishop is in guardian. Now here I kind of thought of some, you know, uh, some other ideas that I could play and get creative. But no, we are old man chess for the win. We're going most basic way to play, eliminate all chance, chance of counterplay. And so what do I do? I exchange off. Boom. Now, essentially, this is a winning position for black. But I still have to win the game. So I played king c6, keeping on the light squares. Uh, he plays king e2. And now, because I have this extra pawn, it's not going to do a whole lot of good stick, staying on d5. Boom. Let's get that pawn rolling. He drops back. I move in. He plays here because this I'm basically attacking uh, the e5 pawn. And if I take the e5 pawn, it's again, it's just going to be much more difficult for me to win. And he's just down another tempo as much as he would want to be able to move these two pawns together to keep me out of e4. Unfortunately, that's not how chess works. Place f5, f4. I play king to e4. I'm getting a tempo on the pawn. Now, there was a funny moment when I played this move that I like hallucinated and I was thinking that if he were to take here and I take here, that there's like a weird like checkmate in the middle of the board, but it's like, oh, then I'm just going to take here. Well, he can't play here because I'm on this pawn. So he plays here, bishop c1. Now he would like to get my king out of the center, knock me out, and play this the next move, but such is ca the case in chess. Check. The king is forced to go back or somewhere. I was expecting him to maybe go here, but then I have things like this. He simply went back here. So what do I do? I'm just guarding these light squares. He plays here. And then I play knight f3, check. This position just made me smile. Um, look at my pieces. My king, my knight, my pawn. We're all just camping out on the light squares. And we are never going to allow this king to come over here uh, or even come over here. Then basically he goes, um, he's kind of forced to go. Um, he ends up going to d1. If he goes here... Essentially, I can just take here, come back, and then drop drop the you know the pawn. Same idea, but because he played king to d1, it, he's completely blocked off. This pawn's gonna fall, and old man chess. Now, granted, the computer says just take the pawn and 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 do your best, but I said you know what, we're gonna stop any chance of counterplay. Now, he could do this, but I would basically go here, and I'm going to win this pawn somehow. Um, after a6, my opponent actually played a4. I chop this pawn. He plays b4, and then I played knight f3, and right here, my opponent resigned. There is nothing that you can do to stop this pawn, and no matter what he tries, you can't stop both of these pawns. And uh, this bishop is entombed. Uh, it's just, it's, it's ugly. So there you have it. Old man chess wins the day. It actually reminded me this game. The first book I ever read, uh, any first chess book I ever read, was called The Complete Idiot's Guide for Chess. And it, I think it's later, it, it's... Uh, it's it's changed the name Grandmaster Patrick Wolf. I think it's uh, how to play chess like a boss or something like that. It's much more uh, it's much more of an appealing name uh, and uh, doesn't offend as you're reading it. But although I read the book in its entirety and I gained a lot from it, and I still think the Complete Idiot's Guide for Chess or How to Play Chess Like a Boss is the best, without exception, in my opinion, the best uh, first book you can buy um for chess and one of the things if, it, if as far as first books go because it goes to the very very basics all the way into kind of some more intermediate ideas and some some concept 
But one of the things that stuck with me, and this is when I was 12 years old, first learning how to play chess, it was this idea of stopping counterplay. Um, and the, the idea was once you learn how to checkmate with like, you know, a king and a queen versus a king, and you know that if you could just advance that pawn. So one of the strategies that I think is very important, especially if you're uh, beginning or uh, more, uh, you know, first starting out in chess is, is if you're winning a position, um, don't, uh, don't allow your opponent counterplay um, at the last moment. I was playing a rapid game today um, and my opponent was crushing me, destroying me. Um, and I've been kind of working on the checkmate patterns on chessable and using that idea, I kind of uh, maneuvered my knight and my rook uh, as a possible checkmate. Uh, they got materialistic, took another one of my pieces, and then I put my knight in a threatening checkmate, and there was nothing that they could do, and uh, one more move was checkmate. What does all that mean? In this game, yes, I could have gone crazy. I could have tried more, you know, creative ideas in the middle game, not exchange the rooks. But once I was up a pawn, and once I thought, okay, I'm just going to eliminate, I'm going to just trade down, and I'm going to march that pawn up the board, and we're going to we're gonna be able to make uh, you know, multiple weaknesses, the principal two weaknesses, and we're going to win this game. So this was the kind of a game, yeah, it felt good uh, to get, get a win against um, a younger player. Uh, some of these kids are strong, and uh, I'm sure Benjamin has a bright, bright future ahead of him in chess. And in a year from now, I won't even be able to touch his rating, and he'll wipe me off the board. And um, But such is the case of life. Such is the case of life. So until then, may all the old man chess players uh, out there uh, be proud of the way we played today. Thanks so much for watching. Please do subscribe. Hit the like button. Let me know if you enjoy these recap videos. If not, hey, I enjoy doing them. And uh, if anything, it helps me uh, explain my thoughts during the game. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.